Ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I used to work up here. I worked here for 10 years, and that's the one thing I do understand is the very uh, vagaries of, of Senate calendars. And uh, Senator Warner has been tied up in some important leadership negotiations, but he still wanted to break free and become uh, come over here to join us. Senator Warner, thank you. We're delighted to have you here. Let me turn the podium to you. Well, thank thank you, you, John. Thank you all. <clears throat> My apologies for um, being late. Uh, I will only uh, say that I believe most everyone in this room, whether U.S. or Indian, would um, probably appreciate the fact that I was a little late since uh, we were very deep into a bipartisan session uh, around what I think is the fundamental issue of our time dealing with our debt and deficit, which will have an enormous challenge not only for this country, but for um, uh, the whole world's economy if we don't get it right. Just, to, just as one little factoid before I get into this, I apologize to kind of get my head out of the one, but if you, if you need any other sense of urgency on this issue, as we are now uh, less than 60 days before a potential default to the United States government, and we now have all three of the rating agencies in effect put, uh, putting the United States on credit watch. And the price of, uh, for example, uh, the chances, the bond markets have said the chances of America's default in the next year is that, and it's priced actually higher than the chances of Mexico's default, Philippines' default, Panama's default. And should we have some circumstance like that, any single one point interest rate spike adds $1.3 trillion to our debt. So a 6 or 7 or 8% interest rate spike, which as we've seen in other countries, if we were to have these circumstances, uh, could add $10 trillion, $10 trillion to our debt. And think about the effects that would have on our economy, the world's economy. So uh, with that as a, a quick apology on the front end for why I was a, a bit tardy. Let me also, and I'm sure he has been acknowledged, I came over and, and um, wanted to pay immediate respects, and he said, I'm in your chair, and I'm in your chair, and he said, well, you've always been in my chair. I just try to follow behind you, but uh, I am, uh, um, there are days I'm, I'm happy to have this job. There are days I um, long for the days when I was in Richmond as governor, uh, but in some small way, I'm trying to uh, follow in the footsteps of somebody who, to my mind, represented what it was the best of what it meant to be a United States senator, the best of what it meant to be somebody who would check his partisan hat at the door when it was the interest of the country or the world, uh, the best at making sure that America maintained uh, its critical role in terms of national security, and that's my dear friend and predecessor, Senator John Warner. Senator Warner, thank you for... I, I want to again thank CSIS, John and Rick, and. Ramesh, I know you have done a great deal on underwriting this uh, uh, for this effort today. And I know uh, this is two days in a row where I've had lunch with the ambassador and Sadakar, I should say. Uh, we were at Saxby Chambliss, who's one of my Republican, co Republican colleagues who are working on the debt and deficit. Uh, we were uh, with the ambassador yesterday, with Sadakar yesterday at the Economics Club in Washington. And I know uh, it was wonderful to see you again, Ambassador, and thank you for all you're doing. And, I believe we also have Secretary Bob Blake is uh, here going to make a presentation in a little while. And I think they will provide perhaps a next level down insight into this um, enormously important growing U.S.-India relationship. Uh, I know I missed um, my, my friend and uh, co-chair of the India Caucus, uh, John Cornyn. Um, he is, was one of the original co-founders of this uh, a caucus with uh, Hillary Clinton and um, my friend Chris Dodd, who then succeeded Senator Clinton, and I'm proud to kind of follow in uh, Chris's footsteps. And you know, as uh, meeting with the ambassador, meeting with so many in the community, we really want to try to um, what's the politically correct term? You know, juice up or reinvigorate the caucus to uh, the kind of status it had uh, in the past, and I think that is. Um, um, important on so many levels. Uh, we all know that you know, India is the largest uh, uh, democracy in the world, America the oldest, 
Um, you know, I think I've never been to a USND event that doesn't make that point and reiterate these strong ties, and I'm going to skip that whole part of the presentation, uh, but I'm happy to give to the press the three pages citing all the wonderful long-term uh, benefits of a collaboration between these, uh, these two great countries. Um, I want to spend my time and kind of more reflect back on the last you know, eight or ten years of this relationship and then hopefully with a little more specificity look forward about what we can do. I mean, as we think um, you know, the challenges that U.S. and India had for a number of years and then the transformation that started to take place in the 90s and really significantly uh, accelerated under President Bush uh, when we moved in much closer collaboration uh, with the Indian government and, and the very important significance in his leadership on the, on the strategic partnership and the nuclear deal. And then that has even, I think, been further accelerated with President Obama. Uh, I think it is significant that uh, the President chose as the first state dinner the, the visit of uh, Prime Minister Singh. And clearly uh, the President's recent visit to India um, where we there was focus not on only kind of cultural collaboration and strategic collaboration, but clearly in terms of, of expanded economic ties, that uh, uh, $15 billion in potential deals and the close to 14,000 jobs that would create here and sustain here in the United States. Uh, and this relationship, and I'm not the diplomat, uh, um, the diplomatic world, I have a hard time, frankly, as a business guy, I had a hard time moving to Richmond as governor, and I thought, that world moves slow. <laughs> then I got to Capitol Hill, and things even started to move slower. And then from what little I know, and I compliment all of you who served in the diplomatic world, that makes Capitol Hill even move, look like it moves fast. <laughs> and so I think while this relationship in kind of diplomatic time has rushed forward, we now are going to enter into a time where we need to continue to make progression, but we frankly need to consolidate and actualize a lot of the agreements that have been made at the top level to kind of work them through the various bureaucracies to kind of make sure that they're, they're fully realized. And, you know, that is where I hope um, the India caucus can play a role. We've seen a upsurge in interest in the India caucus. We've now got uh, close to 40 senators and both Senator Cornyn and I are committed to making that a majority of the Senate uh, in, in short order. It is uh, something that I don't think that will be too much of a challenge. Um, but I think, and our goal as well, at least my part of the goal is, you know, we've moved from, um, I think, talk about democracies to friends to where we really need to move now to true partners. And that partnership means you know, not just the ribbon cuttings and the president and the prime minister and top level agreements, it really means, as I mentioned earlier, um, driving this into specific agreements, working through the regulatory fronts in both the United States and India. And Lord knows that as I've kind of got deeper into this issue, there are a whole host of regulatory challenges in both countries that may not even take legislative change, but, it can, but the Senate ca US India caucus can help on the regulatory front urging along. Um, clearly, this is uh, something that uh, I hear, and we in, in Virginia, I know this is a, a national role, and I'm very proud of that, but we in Virginia are blessed with a, a very, very vibrant, growing, and successful Indian American community, uh, and that is not just Sadaka um, <clears throat> know, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, an area that uh, um, this building this into a full partnership is where I think the caucus can take place. Let's talk about the specific areas. One, um, strong commercial interests. Uh, we will get to defense in a few moments, but I really think there is a window right now um, you know, to really actualize the, the commercial ties. Uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Ambassador Tim Romer pointed out the last time he was back from India that you know, just in the next 10 to 15 years uh, there will be more than a dozen cities in India that will pass 10 million people in population. 
you know, an enormous migration as more than 400 million people move uh, in, into the middle class. Uh, this is a real opportunity for India, but it's also a real opportunity for American business. Uh, I absolutely support the President's goal of trying to uh, double exports uh, over these five years. 95% uh, of the new customers for American business are not going to be domestic, they're going to be foreign. And I think there is a real opportunity here uh, to, uh, for foreign direct investment, uh, U.S. direct investment in India. And that is an area that should be, um, should be a focus. Now, there are um, limits on that right now. There are limits in India, and there, my understanding from recent conversations that there's opportunities even without uh, getting through the, uh, the Indian Parliament uh, abilities for the government there to lift caps in certain areas. And I hope that we can work with our colleagues in India on multi-brand retail, an area that uh, obviously there's a great deal of expertise and opportunity from America, um, insurance, uh, an area of tremendous growth, and the financial sector, the, bank, the banking sectors. Uh, I think this is an area where there can be benefits to India, benefits in terms of uh, American export opportunities, and one that is a doable opportunity in the, the very short term. Uh, so FDI, uh, important. And frankly, FDI the other way from India back in the United States. Uh, uh, I often cite the example of when I was governor uh, in one of our communities in, in uh, Southside Virginia uh, that was candidly not very pro-trade favorable. This was a community, Danville, Virginia, Senator, you recall where we had lost a lot of textile furniture and tobacco jobs. Um, but when I made my first trip to India as governor, and we were able to bring back a, a major polymer com company from India that has now expanded four times uh, and is one of the larger employers in Danville. It's funny how people's views on trade uh, transformed uh, with those benefits going both ways. I still think there's an awful lot we can learn from Indian companies in terms of the ability uh, for insourcing back office technology jobs. Uh, if, if they can do it in Bangalore, they ought to be able to do it in Southside Virginia and Southwest Virginia, and there's a real opportunity for that kind of collaboration. And there still remains, I think, um, enormously critical issues uh, uh, from both the investment side that we've got to sort through certain designation on Indian companies vis-a-vis -a -vis our defense area and try to remove some of those restrictions. And uh, I personally, well, this is, uh, believe that um, uh, while I'm a big, I'm a supporter of comprehensive immigration reform, we ought to be able to move forward on some of the lower hanging fruit, such as entrepreneurial visas. Um, enormous, enormous opportunity here if we perhaps lowered that threshold from a million dollars a bit lower and you know, particularly at this point where our country needs uh, that job creation activity. So you know, this FDI going both ways, and a subset of that being immigration, is, is something that uh, we could actually um, have some results, measurable uh, results over the next year. Second and third would be in, in the area of defense. Um, we have seen uh, uh, India's role and challenges in this uh, uh, world where we not only face challenging nation states but also the potential threat of terrorism. India, as we all know, has suffered its own 9-11 in Mumbai. And uh, there is enormous opportunity, I think, for collaboration on the strategic front in terms of our defense communities uh, over the coming year. Uh, both in terms of joint exercises, in terms of closer collaboration. And we need to set out, I think, a definable set of goals for this collaboration, again, where the caucus can uh, um, be an active uh, uh, urger of uh, Secretary Gates and, and hopefully Secretary Panetta in expanding this level of collaboration. Um, the third area, again, is in terms of defense sales. Now, uh, I know there were some of us who uh, we're a little concerned on the aircraft decision. And uh, if you decide, Madam Ambassador, you want to have a change of heart, <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to, uh, we'd be happy, I'm sure Senator Warner would agree with this, we can get you down to Hampton Roads pretty quick and put you in a, you know, an F-15, F-16, and you know, show you some of the quality of our jets. Um, but uh, if that is not 
uh, you know, changed over. You know, we did see some uh, good news on the, the C-17s uh, recently announcement. And I do believe, and, and, and there are a number of other items in the queue. And what we need to do is make sure that those items in the queue actually get to contract status. And again, I think there is a role that we can work uh, as an advocate uh, on that. And I frankly think the, the military sales issue is intertwined with the cooperation issue. If we have a closer strategic cooperation, the comfort level uh, of the Indian Defense Forces uh, with uh, American equipment will dramatically advance, and that is, again, to both countries' benefits. So, you know, we have had this relationship that has raced ahead in the last uh, decade plus. I think it is this relationship from a whole host of regions, strategic, economic, uh, the combined cultural ties is uh, perhaps the area where the greatest gains in the 21st century in terms of any major relationship for uh, America has taken place. I think we're going to enter, and while we need to keep racing forward, I think we're going to enter into a period of some um, consolidation at this point. We may not see the same kind of dramatic announcements, but our job should be making sure that consolidation uh, is realized on foreign direct investment, both directions, on continuing to open ties uh, immigration-wise, on strategic partnership uh, on the defense area, and making sure that there's a promise of uh, some of that military purchasing procurement uh, takes place. And I simply want to say that uh, as this honor is the new co-chair of the U.S. India Caucus. Uh, this is something that I sought out, something that I uh, went to the Democratic leadership, uh, John, asked to see if I could get. I'm not on the Foreign Relations Committee, um, but uh, uh, my visits to India and, and my wife and children's visit to India, this is a, a phenomenal country with a phenomenal culture, and I think long-term will be the cornerstone of uh, one of the great partnerships, friendships, and alliances for both our countries for decades to come. So let's make sure we realize these items. And uh, my thanks to all of you. And in the meantime, pray for a bipartisan solution to our debt and deficit crisis. Thank you all very much. Senator, thank you. We, uh, we're really honored that you would come for this, for the India Caucus, but we really do want you to succeed on the bipartisan negotiations. I, would, I, I do stay awake at night worrying about that. Rick, into first, let me bring you up. Rick is the Wadwani Chair at CSIS. Uh, we're so pleased to have him uh, lead this up for us, and he's going to lead the rest of the program. Rick, thank you very much.